testing and the scalability aspect of it uh, in IAP Hyderabad. Um, so when we, uh, like when I joined, there were um, two or three courses already available. And then we started growing. And uh, since then, in the, the uh, last two, three years, we came quite a uh, long distance, but uh, still miles to cover. So what we'll do is, um, I'll just go over the thought process that we went through and where we stand today uh, to, uh, to, to present our case, as kind of a case study for you to uh, take some inputs from and then design your curriculum and pedagogy in your environment when you uh, go back to your So um, the way we uh, thought was um, to uh, first take a large view, whether uh, we understand the field. Okay. Um, we scoped out the program, aims and ambitions, um, so not always in a very conscious manner, but in somewhat organically. And then um, the, logical, the logical division uh, of, of, the, of the topics uh, brought into courses, which are like uh, elementary, course, elementary topics, uh, more uh, like intermediate topics, advanced courses. The topics uh, had to overlap a little bit so that the students have a, 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 a correlation between them. They can connect, uh, but not too much of overlap so that they get bored. And then uh, we, we needed, we, we designed a course sequence where there is a clear precedence and clear depth and so that we can add more value. Uh, so we'll, I will cover mostly the course curriculum design aspect, whereas course instruction will just uh, kind of briefly uh, touch. Uh, a lot of uh, my uh, uh, speakers have uh, done a very good uh, job on that. Uh, so let us first look at the gamut of DSP. So there are three things involved. The types of signals and tasks we do, we can choose the that are available. So if you look at uh, DSP signals, they're extremely bad. It could be one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, all different things, speech, audio, uh, picture, images, satellite imagery, video, which is like special temporal or 3D objects, and 3D objects in motion. Um, then there is multimedia, where it's, these are nothing but synchronized media of different types, like text, audio, video, and multimodal um, signals where the same object or the same scene is being imaged or um, acquired with, with different modality. So, so probably the easily, most easily recognizable things are like X-ray, CT scan, MRI, or uh, the same maybe organ and tissue to detect an anomaly, which the doctors do. And what do we want to do with them? So we <coughs> sometimes would like to detect an object, maybe an aircraft from an, uh, an image, maybe an anomaly in a medical image, Maybe a target uh, in a radar application. Sometimes you want to enhance. Sometimes you want to restore. Maybe you want to remove noise. Uh, sometimes you want to estimate certain parameters from it. Sometimes we just like to compress so that we can transmit it effectively. And sometimes we just want to uh, process in such a way that the uncertainty that we are not able to visual, uh, envision ahead of time can be handled. Well. And how do we do all this? We um, Basic DSP, of course, it's almost everybody who are in this field, they have like uh, normal uh, processing of linear design variant signal. But later on, I mean, if you uh, go deep into compression, there's transcoding, all these things, and uh, say harmonic analysis, time frequency analysis, composite sensing, which is a new topic, uh, the modern based uh, analysis like random processes, uh, vector structure theory and so on. Then uh, learning theory and game theory, of which uh, some of it has been already covered. So now, um, in our case, what we did is, of course, we couldn't cover the whole gamut. We, we, we did um, a core topics have been covered in two, uh, two ways. One is the theory course in DSP and, uh, and, and the practical part, which is in DSP lab. Then we go specialized in, in speech signal processing, uh, image and video, multimedia, immersive multimedia, which is higher dimensional signal processing, like 3D and 4D processing. Even we have, uh, it's from chemical engineering department, some signals originating on, in, in biochemical sources. Um, then, uh, of course, they are supporting uh, this. These are the courses like estimation, detection, adaptive signal processing. They give advanced tools. 
And again, these are um, not exactly considered uh, signal processing uh, courses in general, but they are almost essential to learn different aspects of signal processing. Probability theory, information theory, applied algebra, um, neural networks, pattern recognition, this has been already touched upon, uh, system identification, wavelet theory, uh, or sparse representation, things like that. So, um, now it's in a nutshell, actually, this is the exercise. You visualize the whole field, chop it into small parts, and then packetize them into courses so that they have a well laid dependency structure. People can learn, they can, they can follow through how to grow through this, this topic. Very good. Um, now I'll just give you some example of how, what our experience, how we, we do it, and what are the dependency, uh, dependency structures, and how we are kind of traveling through this sequence of courses at uh, IT Hydro. So at the base, is ESP, E5300. Here the core topics are we cover, like real linear time invariant systems, convolution, Fourier transform, ADC, DSC, sampling, all these different things. I'm sure we are extremely expert on all this. Um, here, what we try to do is to make the learning, uh, you know, to speak to the student's mind, there's a, there's a DSP, DSP lab. Where uh, we have two, two pronged approach. There's some part of it is um, done in hardware, parts of it is done in software, which is essentially man uh, So, take for example filter design. Maybe the design aspect is, is done in software so that you get the filter coefficient, etc. Then you implement that in, in the hardware, say uh, TMS320, which is, I'm sure, many of you are using already. And um, so that gives a code. But then, what we do ahead? So, so far, when we introduce the core techniques, we normally only talk about one-dimensional signals, okay, which could be like speech or audio. Uh, then, uh, of course, they are uh, going deeper into spe uh, specific uh, aspects of speech and audio. That's a different course of there. Uh, but suppose we want to step up, we want to go to two dimensions. Then we look for uh, two dimension uh, the image processing. Where, I mean, here I'm giving you some example using some medical data. These are like uh, ocular um, optical coherence tomography data from the back of our eye. Here, the idea is that we want to understand what is the thickness of this choroid layer, like how many vessels are there. This is an important problem that is given to us by LB by, uh, Professor Dai Institute. This is really, this is some really uh, taken from uh, uh, some, uh, some patients. And, this is a task that is faced by doctors. So there are enhancement techniques that we need, there are age protection techniques we need. Sometimes uh, we need to segment out these vessels in the program. Uh, so all these things and uh, other, other things, for example, there are two views taken for, for with the same camera but with different poses. But you want to see the big picture, where the whole scene came from, image composition. Uh, these are the different tasks we, we do in 2 day signal processing. And as I said, there are overlaps between courses. So some courses, they, uh, like this one, that, that really focuses on the practical aspects, not too much into it. And then this gives the theory, but again, there are project components where this can be included. Now the MRC multimedia, uh, of course, which, although it is going towards higher dimension, as a preliminary requirement, this kind of things are into it. So, this is a demonstration of how things can go on. Then we're going to say 3D processing. Here, um, say there is a, there are two ways you can do 3D. One is two dimensions coming from spatial and one dimension coming from temporal, which is our usual view, things that you see on YouTube. What is a video? It's nothing but a sequence of images. But all that is happening is that this small change is happening between frame to frame. And the best way to exploit this dependence, suppose you want to encode, suppose you want to run something like a YouTube, you want your data to be represented with as little uh, uh, I mean, volume as possible. What you do is you simply take a difference, but in an intelligent manner. You shift this, uh, this, this current frame by something called the motion vector, how much it has moved. And the difference actually is minimal. This doesn't take too much of data to represent. So that's the, 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 the essentially the core of video processing. So then we uh, go to uh, say another way we can do three dimensional. It's like three D object itself. 
the, the, the thing that I was talking about OCT data, they're actually coming from uh, a small part of retina and, uh, and, and layers below. There's one layer for RP, then there is a layer choroid, which I was talking about, then sclera, which is the installation that actually helps us see, because if the lights are coming from here, you'll not see anything. Yeah. So, uh, so the task really here is to understand how much choroidal vessel that is there. Is it definitive? Is it enough there? So for a doctor, it, and, and it normally comes in slices. If you just look at the slices, it's very difficult to judge what is really happening in this whole theory body. So what we are doing here is stacking them together, doing some processing, and showing in the the, the whole 3D forward volume, we are taking out all other things, like retina, RP, sclera, we are taking out, and just showing the choroid. And here you see the catheter region. So, and, and then the, the sides, yeah, apparently the, 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 the layers are present pretty well, but in, in the middle, it's catheter. So this helps doctors see things. And how do we visualize it? There is a, an advanced 3D visualization uh, display in our lab. You, you are welcome to visit sometime. It's actually, allows you to see the 3D as you are seeing your friend in front of you. If it is not a projection, uh, the 2D projection as you see in the computer screen. It's an actual 3D. Uh, so that's one thing that we saw. A 3D object, if it is given to you, you can process. But how do you generate content? It's very difficult to do. It will not get across this. So in our lab, we have abilities to actually generate 3D content by taking multiple views, either through a camera network, or it's a timetable setup where the object is uh, moved round and round and take many views. So just like this. So it's, it's, it's a toy aeroplane. It's there in our lab. You can see. And then using these views using advanced algorithm, we can build 3D models. That's the 3D data which you can then process. And this is like three different views when the, uh, of the same 3D model is taken. And there's small differences, probably not very easily visible, but it's there. If you visit the lab, you can probably have a look at this. Now, final thing is that, well, 3D objects could be in motion. In reality, suppose your neuron, etc., they're not static. There's uh, one important thing that is happening inside the neuron is the calcium density is fluctuating. And that is really the signal that gets transmitted to synapses. So that is something you, I mean, it's, it's an important um, parameter for biologists to look at, even the medical people to look at. And this is something we, we can visualize here. So this is a data. It's slightly harder to see on the slide. If you look at it, there are um, areas which are not well lit. That means there is a, a tagging uh, molecule whose concentration is low. Then the next frame, in, in those places, glitter. OK? That means the concentration went up, went up high. And this is happening in, in four dimensions, three spatial dimension and one uh, temporal dimension. And that's what is very important. Why three-dimensional representation is necessary? Because the neuron is a very weird structure. If you take a slice, you don't almost see anything. Okay? You really have to capture the whole thing in, in, in three spatial dimensions and look at its, its temporal thing. And that's where a display like this comes very handy. It's, it's very important to have something. And this is uh, uh, really uh, some data. It's, it's another uh, important aspect is the collaboration. This, uh, this data has been, a chemical engineering course um, taken uh, for the biochemical, biochemical signals and systems, where really the origins, the, the physiology behind this is being studied. Whereas we do the processing in reverse technology. So all these things are going hand in hand. And essentially, um, bring back to the old uh, you know, theme that really the future is in interdisciplinary research. We, we have to reach out. So coming back, really, what I am flashing the same slide again. Essentially, I, uh, in, in my uh, talk, I tried to uh, kind of scope out what happened here at right? Hyderabad. We looked at the scope, we, we tried to design courses which like, uh, take care of different topics. Kind of multidisciplinary aspect. I mean, in our um, experience, we felt the students were extremely motivated. So many people, uh, I mean, one of my students, they said, I want to know how the brain functions. Of course, as a signal processing engineer, I have really no clue. I just process the signal. But because of the collaborators, now he has a pathway to know how the brain functions. So, and, and that guy was really an electrical engineer. But now a pathway has been created for him to fulfill his dream. And 
Uh, there's another student who graduated this, uh, this semester. He went to, uh, he has now uh, gone to Johns Hopkins University, where our director is from. Um, that, that's an extremely good school where both the signal processing and the med school uh, is good. So places like that then can help realize uh, these students' dream. And hopefully down the line, when we come up to the same kind of standards, we'll be able to fulfill their dream right here in India. And, uh, and uh, as a closing remark, as I said, uh, Honorable uh, Minister uh, Dr. Palam Raju and Honorable uh, Action Secretary uh, Ms. Sharma, uh, Ms. Shah. And um, if we get sufficient support here, we really create this way, can create this way. If there is enthusiasm in students, there is enthusiasm in faculty members. And we also know we have more or less started out the path, not completely, but to a great extent. All we need is some hand some kind of, uh, like, uh, you know, we can ignore some of our thoughts, not every step we take can be correct. But really, we are here uh, with uh, the 100% commitment to go the long way. And, uh, and then, the same way, we want to. Uh, uh, disseminate this knowledge that we have got and gathered to the next layer of colleges like uh, uh, local colleges, NITs, so the whole ecosystem. So that's where.